Hello, I'm Kim Carter. I'm a Bangor graduate and apprentice keeper at ZSL London Zoo. To kick off this mini series, I'll be talking about the work ZSL London Zoo, alongside our fantastic partners, are doing to develop viable release strategies for rehabilitated big headed turtles in Vietnam. I'd like to firstly dedicate and thank the Asian Turtle Programme and Indo Myanmar Conservation for all their fantastic work. ZSL London Zoo is a partner in this project, but these two charities do all the hard work on the ground and it wouldn't be in place without them. Asia has the greatest tortoise and freshwater turtle diversity than any other biographic realm, with more than 90 of the world's known 335 turtle species found in this region. This makes up to 32% of the world's tourist and freshwater turtle diversity, of which 24 species are endemic to this range. 78% of these species have been assessed as threatened by the IUCN, the highest number of threatened tortoise and freshwater turtle species anywhere in the world. In Vietnam, planted agriculture, grazing livestock, deforestation and fires all contribute to habitat loss, playing a major role in the threats towards tortoise and turtle species. However, the biggest threat facing them in Vietnam is the non-sustainable trade for meat and alternate medicines. There are many local markets in Vietnam, but actually most of the turtles will end up across the border in China. We don't know the exact volume of turtles being traded, but it is fast. In the 90s and early 2000s, it was estimated that 2.6 to 12 million turtles were traded across Asia. In 2004, around 10,000 freshwater turtles and tortoises were traded. And in 2009, it was estimated that 145,000 turtles and tortoises were traded in this region. Some of these turtles and tortoises are confiscated and sent to rescue centres within the area, such as the Turtle Conservation Centre. This has put a lot of pressure on these rescue centres as turtles can't be released back into the wild. Uh, euthanasia is not often an option. And due to historic low poles, uh, many of these colonians will enter the illegal trade once again. There are difficulties releasing animals back into the wild because of taxonomic uncertainty. Many are intercepted at border points with China, but they could have been transported from anywhere within Vietnam or even across Southeast Asia. There also poses a risk of mixing and spreading of pathogens and this movement um, creates the mixing of species that would not normally come in contact, not only across Southeast Asia, but also many North American turtle species are bred and traded within Southeast Asia. This poses a threat as many native species will come in contact with pathogens that are non-native and they're not adapted to deal with. To release these turtles as they would be, go would be going against the IUCN translocation guidelines, which state that you need to minimize risk carrying by carrying out genetic screening and pathogen screening prior to release. One of the main focuses these collaborators have been working on is the big-headed turtle, Platysternum megacephalum. These are an endangered species but are being reassessed soon and will most likely be reclassified as critically endangered. They are monophyletic species which make them the perfect candidate to be an edge species which are evolutionally distinct and globally endangered. There are currently three subspecies, and although there are differences in morphology, it's not thought to be a reliable indicator for telling them apart. They uh, live in montane areas in cool, clean, fast flowing streams, and they are an aggressive and highly territorial species. The illegal collection and trade of big headed turtles are having a noticeable impact on population densities. In 2003, in a protected area in southern China, there were over 120 individuals per kilometre of stream. This study was repeated in 2013 in a similar area, and population density had dropped to between 0 and 0.36 animals per kilometre of stream. This shows the scale of exploitation. Many big-headed turtles that are confiscated are taken to rescue centres such as the Cook Prong Conservation Centre. There are many difficulties in managing these seizures. Many rescue centres are located in areas of low elevation that get very hot in summer. Big-headed turtles inhabit cool mountain streams and because of their aggressive territorial nature, it's difficult to maintain high densities that all need to be housed individually uh, with high quality fresh water and to be kept cool. Many also need veterinary care because of these methods in which they are captured, like this turtle with an embedded fish hook. 
The rescue centres do a fantastic job, but these animals take a lot of resources and it's difficult to keep them long term. In 2015, there were 50 turtles at Crook Pond Conservation Centre. There has since been an increase in trade due to a shift in demand of the bigoted turtles due to their rarity and also as a result of a decline in other turtle species that are commonly illegally traded. Additionally, there has been a huge success in confiscations through education and the ability to ID these species more effectively, which is great that they aren't being traded, but it also means there's a higher pressure on the rescue centres taking these turtles in which means there are now over 200 turtles at the rescue centre, all of which needs to be held separately with sensitive life support needs. It's not possible to provide life support systems for each turtle independently, so this involves the staff performing regular water changes. This obviously puts a lot of pressure on the staff to maintain the animal's needs. Some of the barriers to releasing these turtles are that there's no baseline data on pathogens found in wild turtles in Southeast Asia. We just don't know what's considered normal when screening caught turtles. Turtles are scarce, so it's difficult to get a good sample size to get this baseline data. Genetic screening and pathogen screening is expensive, and these are conservation charities with limited funding. There was no capacity in the country to do molecular analysis of pathogens prior to this study and many vets had experience exclusively in commercial livestock. And lastly, CITES paperwork is difficult to obtain quickly to alleviate the time that these turtles spend in the centres. So how are some of these barriers being overcome? The Funding Foundation Segway help provide funding that can improve the captive condition within these turtle centres and help prepare for the release. Genetic samples can be processed at a lab in Hanoi and positive control for pathogens, the herpes and mycobacteria pathogens and we can start screening wild tortoises and turtles more effectively. The ongoing project at the Asian Turtle Programme and indo Myanmar Conservation is managed by Edge Fellow Ha. In this photo, cloacal swabs are being taken for pathogen screening. At the proposed release sites, community questionnaires are taken and this helps us get a knowledge of how the local community see the turtles. So whether there's a historic use for turtles, uh, any current use, any perception on the turtles and if there's any information known about the current legislation and protection of the turtles. There's a collaboration with protected area managers and this helps the turtle local communities from exploiting. Four wild turtles are taken at each site and are screened for pathogen and genetics and also it's just to see what species are currently present at these sites. And these are compared with the seized big headed turtle genetic and pathogen screening. And this all helps us get a good idea of whether these proposed release sites will be suitable for them. Ha at Edgefellow has been doing radio telemetry and fitting data loggers to a subset of big headed turtles. He also regularly weighs them and screens them for pathogens. All of the data helps us adapt our husbandry at the zoo and also helps inform the natural history of this species. And this is one of the community questionnaires in action. Just finding out what the locals know about these turtles and if there's any perception or any current or past uses of the turtles. A subset of turtles were released and fitted with radio tags and data loggers. All of these turtles were tested negative for herpes. They weren't tested for mycoplasma because this was not considered a high risk and many turtles have commensal mycoplasma. This just shows how hard radio telemetry can be in this habitat. At ZSL we use evidence-based husbandry and observations and research from the field by these amazing researchers help us adapt our care of our captive turtles. This photo shows a wild brumating big headed turtle. I adapted the brumation temperatures and water depth based on observation on brumation sites, water and air temperatures as well as the limited information sourced in peer reviewed journals. So this wild observation is essential to keeping them. So what are the results of this project? There have been confirmations for big-headed turtles already at some of the proposed release sites. These were tested negative for pathogen screening. A subspecies has been confirmed at the Turtle Conservation Centre using genetic screening. 
There have been some cases of animals with mycoplasma and colonian herpes virus despite no clinical signs of the disease. So the next step is to identify the strain and find out where these pathogens might have originated from. Could they be naturally occurring or is this a result of the mixed species during trade? Finally, a disease risk analysis is currently being drafted to aid in whether an animal is suitable for release. What limitations do we need to get over? We need to plan what to do with the animals that are tested positive for pathogens. Only two pathogens could be screened due to a limited budget and these were seen as the most important to test. We would like to test more. And although the, the lab do a fantastic work, there is a backlog and a delay in releasing animals and a limitation in the sensitivity of tests. But is it all too late anyway? Should we focus on disease screening if there are already pathogens present in the proposed sites from past releases? In 2009 in Kukpong, there was a workshop organised by Tony Sainsbury of the IOZ Institute of Zoology and this was to discuss rescue centres and releasing animals for conservation. There are many delegates from endangered primates, bear rescue, from saving Vietnamese wildlife, the government and other rescue centres. In an ideal world, we wouldn't want to be using animals from rescue centres for conservation relocations. But some are so rare and they're not being bred in zoos in the area that rescue centres actually provide a good resource for these animals to be used in a conservation benefit. The IUCN guidelines ensure a translocation in line with best practice. This also solves animal welfare in the centres as it reduces strains. It breaks the cycles of animals coming into the rescue centres and nothing coming out. At the end of 2018, four big-headed turtles arrived at ZSL after being rescued from smugglers trying to illegally import them into Canada. August last year, one of these went on show to help showcase this species and all of the achievements by Asian Turtle Program and Indo-Myanmar Conservation. We have more exciting plans in line for our ZSL turtles this year, including a recent documentary, documentary by ITV that will be released later in this year. I'd just like to finish by saying a huge thank you to all of our partners and sponsors and all the fantastic work they do. This project wouldn't be there without them. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. If there are any questions, I'll be available on Facebook Live at 8 o'clock to answer them.